knowledge, used 172 times in 169 verses of the Bible. The art of defeating ignorance and gaining knowledge, both divine and natural. Holiness is not a hidden work or an ascetic work where you go away and hide out in a mountain somewhere. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. Welcome to the Quick Study Television program. It is great to have you with us today. As we continue going through the Bible in one year, I want to say a special hello to all of the folks watching in Albuquerque, New Mexico on Sun Broadcasting Stations. Thank you for joining us, and uh, what an amazing ministry that is. Mm -hmm. And today, as we go through the Bible in one year, we land, of course, in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, 39, I should say, where we are going to be talking about being different. God calls His people to be holy, to be different. And so as we look at that today, we're going to learn what that actually means. To be holy isn't to shroud yourself in some kind of mystical garment and go hide away in a cave. That's not being holy. So what is it? Well, we'll talk about it coming up in just a moment. It is very relevant to today. Corey is also here with Bible Archaeology. Corey? Well, not only are we going to track the very intriguing and mysterious history of the Ark of the Covenant, we're also going to be taking a look at the first city we know of that it was housed after the conquest of the Promised Land. That city is Bethel. Oh, that's interesting. So the Ark of the Covenant was in Bethel before it was in Shiloh. Yes, sir. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, we'll talk about that. Bethel, of course, being formerly Luz, and uh, that's uh, Jacob renamed it. Anyway, let's get to do you know. And this is kind of a fun question, I think. Do you know what the bronze laver in the tabernacle was made from? The bronze laver in the mm -hmm. tabernacle was made from. All okay. right, let's study on. Exodus chapter 37 records the making of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, right now, you and I are going to explore the first city where the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant were kept once the Israelites moved into the Promised Land. The city of Bethel's first biblical mention is in Genesis chapter 12, when Abraham camps between this city and Ai. Later, in Genesis 28, we're told that Bethel's original Canaanite name was Luz, meaning almond tree. Jacob, Abraham's grandson, has a vision here of a stairway between heaven and earth with angels coming and going on it. Through this vision, God makes a vow to Jacob that he will give the land to his descendants, bless the earth through them, and be with him always. Jacob's response is to set up a stone marker at the site and name the place Bethel, meaning house of God. An interesting part of Jacob's promise to God is often overlooked. He says about the stone marker, This stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that you give me I will surely give a tenth to you. This statement about a house of God being located at Bethel is likely the reason that generations later, after the exodus and conquest, the Ark of the Covenant is temporarily seen at Bethel. Judges chapter 20 has the Israelite army inquiring of the Lord at Bethel, where the Ark of the Covenant and priests are acting. Bethel's history is not all pleasant for Israel. It was used after the days of David and Solomon by Jeroboam, king of northern Israel, as a replacement for temple worship. Jeroboam set up a golden calf idol in Bethel and began a pagan worship system that would earn Bethel a destructive place in biblical prophecy. 
For many years, since the 1830s, scholars have identified Bethel as modern-day Beitin. But today, there are some challenges to this being championed by Associates for Biblical Research, who favor the village of Albira. Despite the disagreement, everyone knows that Bethel existed. Hopefully, future excavations will illuminate this biblical history. Well, it is time to study the wise guys of the Bible. They're all around us. Now, the priestly wise guys are interesting. The work of God's priest was not a normal work. It was not a material work only. It was a universal work. What the wise guys of the priesthood wore to reflect the high and holy authority in which they operated is in Exodus 39. It confirms what Exodus 28, 1 and 4 had previously stated. Listen, blue, purple, and scarlet threads in the garments of the priest were a sign of God's lordship over heaven and his royal position as Messiah and the sacrifice of blood required for dispensing of holiness to his priest. This is wise. Exodus 39, 1 through 7. Of the blue, purple, and scarlet thread, they made garments of ministry for ministering in the holy place, and made the holy garments for Aaron as the Lord had commanded Moses. He made the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and of fine woven linen. And they beat the gold into thin sheets and cut it into threads to work it in with the blue, purple, and scarlet thread and the fine linen into artistic designs. They made shoulder straps for it to couple it together, and it was coupled together at its two edges. And the intricately woven band of his ephod that was on it was of the same workmanship, woven of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and of fine woven linen as the Lord had commanded Moses. And they set onyx stones, enclosed in settings of gold. They were engraved as signets are engraved with the names of the sons of Israel. He put them on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Exodus chapter 39, verses 1 through 7. Well, you know, it's amazing in our culture today, there's a great emphasis on be an original and be yourself. No matter what anybody else says, be yourself. And that's propagated by a lot of the fundamental secularists, which is fine. I think that's a great virtue. As a matter of fact, it's a biblical one. But what if being different means being pure? What if being different means remaining a virgin till you're married? Will you get ridiculed for that? What if being different means getting married and then having children? What if being different means being holy and desiring to serve God? Would we have the same zeal and emphasis on be yourself? I'm not sure. It's interesting. But God did command His people, ancient Israel, to be different from the rest of the world around them. So today we explore this being different in the context of holiness. Now there is wisdom here and a great deal of it. We've isolated three specific points to this wisdom. It comes from Exodus chapter 39. Let us begin reading because it is an amazing story. So here we have in Exodus chapter 39 verse 1, of the blue and purple and scarlet thread, they made garments of ministry for ministering in the holy place and made the holy garments for Aaron as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now notice this, because the priests of the tabernacle are required to wear a uniform. And this particular uniform 
has meaning and spiritual significance. You have these various elements woven into the priest. You have the, the sons of Jacob, you know, the, the, the jewels on the breastplate. Inside the breastplate, you have the urim and the thummim. I mean, you've got the hat that says holy to the Lord. I mean, you, you've got these things that, that are totally, completely different than anything around them and, and even different than Pharaoh's religions, different from the religions of the Canaanites, different from the religions of, uh, of the Philistines and the Hittites. And so here God is saying, I want you to be different. I want you to be holy. Brings us to this wisdom point. Holiness is not a hidden work. The cost of the cross and the work of Messiah is in full public view all the time in God's work. Uh, beloved, I love the song. One of my favorite groups, uh, singing groups, and this may surprise some of you, is actually DC Talk. I love that group. Uh, I still listen to the, they're, they're not together anymore, but I still listen to the old albums. And uh, what they say is, what would people think if they knew I was a Jesus freak? And that is their whole point of that song is you've got all these different people in the world and they're dressed crazy from different cultures and all these people say, well, just let them alone, let them be different. But when it comes to being a Jesus freak, all of a sudden we're ridiculed. And all of a sudden us being different is, there's a double standard here. And DC Talk talks about that. But God says, don't pay attention to the world, pay attention to me, I want you to be different. And I want you to be publicly different. May I say, beloved, that God has no secret service officers that he says, go into all the world and live the good news. Preach the good news, and if necessary, use words, but live the good word. And so we are to be different, and holiness is not to be hidden. And so uh, be different as long as you don't do it, you know, around me. No, not necessarily. You are who you are, and may we have an integrity between what we say and how we live. That integrity needs to return. Well, let's go on to Exodus 39, and let us look at verses 2 through 5, where the Bible says, He made the ephod of gold, blue, purple, scarlet, thread, this is the priest, and of woven linen. And they beat the gold into thin sheets and cut it into thin threads to work it in with the blue and the purple and the scarlet thread and the fine linen into artistic designs. What a uniform for the priest. Verse 4, they made the shoulder straps for, for it to couple uh, together, to, be, to bring it together. It was coupled together at its two edges. And the intricately woven band of his ephod that was on it was the same workmanship of woven gold, blue, purple, scarlet thread, and fine woven linen. The Lord had commanded this to Moses. Now here is another holiness wisdom point. Holiness means we have recognized God's authority, which is the gold, God's lordship of heaven, which is the blue, and God's royal authority over the earth, which is the purple, in our life style worship. You know, there's a lot of talk about um, worship, music worship. We have worship magazines and worship music and we have worship bands and we have worship this and worship that. Here are worship, there are worship. But beloved, I love music and believe me, I love worship. But worship is so much more than music. It is easy to worship God when we are together with another thousand people listening to a beautiful worship band, sing and praise. It's easy for us to clap our hands and say hallelujah and speak in tongues and all the things we do. But when we get out into the real world, into the real life, that, my friend, is where the true power of worship comes into play. And so may we, like the priests were required to do, wear our worship and clothe ourselves, as Paul says, like with God's righteousness, not with arrogance, but with humility and say, I'll tell you what, we're a sinner saved by grace. We figured out where the well was. We know where the well is. We're no better than you, but if you want to know where the well of Jesus Christ is, we can show you. And that's a different attitude. So, beloved, may I say to today, right now, that as the priests were to wear the authority of God. So we are to wear it in our lives. Life style worship is the key. Well, now let's go on to the next passage, which is even more fascinating. Uh, everywhere, as we, as we look at this, we, we see in verse th uh, six, and they set onyx stones enclosed in settings of gold. There's God's authority again. And the onyx stones, of course, representing God's servants. And they were engraved 
as signets are engraved with the names of the sons of Israel. And so he put them on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones to remember for the sons of Israel as the Lord had commanded them, commanded Moses. So our third holiness principle here is very important, and that is this. Holiness and the desire of holiness is the way we worship our Lord in our lives. Now, the best way that I can say this is if you love someone, you desire to change for them. And so we drive our lives by the love of God, not to, you know, say to ourselves, oh, we're p perfect, upstanding Christians, and to present some kind of facade, some kind of whitewashed image, to fit into some kind of peer uh, pressure culture of the church. No. We wear our worship by loving Jesus. When we love Jesus more than we love our own sin, then we will wear the worship. That, beloved, is lifestyle worship. Now the Ark of the Covenant is a very mysterious and very intriguing artifact from the pages of Exodus. Right now what you and I are going to do is explore some of its history and the mystery behind it. The Ark ends up going missing. From movies to books to investigative adventures, there is perhaps no other ancient biblical artifact that has gained so much attention than the Ark of the Covenant. The instructions for making the Ark are first given in Exodus chapter 25, with the express purpose of making a container full of symbolism to contain the tablets of the testimony that had written on them the law of God. This accounts for the Ark being called interchangeably the Ark of the Testimony, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Lord, and even the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. The Ark was made out of acacia wood and was covered with gold inside and out, complete with two golden cherubim that sat on top of the Ark with wings outstretched. The golden cover of the Ark perhaps accounts for some treasure seekers today that would like to find it, but it is not the physical value of the box that's most alluring. Strange, miraculous events are tied with the Ark of the Covenant all through Scripture. From the history of Uzzah's unfortunate death when he unlawfully touched the Ark, to the enemy Philistines capturing the Ark, only to be met with their idols mysteriously falling before it, and the population becoming sick with tumors until they returned it to Israel. If the miracles and curses associated with the Ark weren't enough to pique interests, its disappearance from the Bible and history is enough. During the time period of the Judges, the Ark moved to a few different cities until the completion of King Solomon's temple when it received a permanent place in the Holy of Holies. But that is the last it is heard of. It is possible that the Ark was stolen in one of the many enemy raids on the temple, but it is never mentioned or listed with the goods taken. Some of the most popular alternate theories are that the Ark is hidden somewhere beneath the Temple Mount, or that it resides in Ethiopia, guarded religiously by relations of the Israelites. What is prophecy, really? What makes a prophet in today's modern world? Is there really such a thing as prophecy or a prophet in today's modern world? Why does God use prophets in the Bible? In the last two years, many so-called prophets, many of the biblical prophets they claim, have predicted the end of time and all kinds of events, but much of it has not come true. Join the quick study on air ministry team as they tackle the difficult subject of biblical prophecy and biblical prophets in today's world. Are they real according to the Bible? 
This one hour DVD begins with a careful look at prophecy according to the Bible. Then the last half hour, questions are answered from many people all over the world who called in during the recording process of this program. To get your copy today, video DVD of Prophecy, What Is It According to the Bible, send $25 or more to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. The United States send to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. Okay, welcome. The, you know, you're watching Quick Study Television, by the way, if you just tuned in. Now, we, we tape the programs out of sequence. Right. In other words, we'll, what we'll do, just for those viewers who watch, we, we'll tape all of the st- stuff where we're here, mm-hmm. the openers and this discussion segment. Then later, I'll tape the teaching segments afterwards, and we tape the various voiceovers at different times. Corey's already taped her segments for uh-huh. this. So they're taped out of sequence, and the editors put it all together. And so we have all this worked out in an efficient pattern. And we don't know what each other's doing. Right. You know? We don't actually. <laughs> we study. We all run up on our offices and study like crazy, work, 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 and then all of a sudden we pull it all together. It really is a testament to the work of the Holy Spirit, yes. Actually. Indeed, and uh, and the the, the spirit filled uh, editors uh, yeah. that put it all together. Anyway, so we were discussing this whole question because the question you ask, well, ask the question. You thought first. it was a trick question. Yeah, I did. Seems well, listen like a trick to it. Question. Listen to how. She, okay, go ahead. Do you know what the bronze laver in the tabernacle was made from? And so I said, you thought that was. Well, it's made of bronze. Mm-hmm. <laughs> did, is that a, what, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Is that a trick question? And that's what I thought, Corey. I know. It's what I thought at first, too. And then we realized, together we realized that that couldn't be, it can't just be bronze. No, because here's what she said. Now, ask it like you asked it before with the emphasis on of. Do you know what the bronze laver in the tabernacle was made from? Made from. from. Made from. from. So it's oh. bronze. What? And then the light bulbs went off. It and did. we remembered the the bronze laver was made from the bronze mirrors of the women who served at the entrance of the tabernacle. So, that's so is that right? Absolutely right. That's exactly <laughs> right. And you might miss that if you're just reading through. You might you might miss. So that. let me yeah. get this straight. Yeah. Apparently, they had mirrors made of bronze, like mm-hmm. individual yes. mirrors made of bronze. They could yes. see themselves and yes. put on their garments and their makeup. They and were all very that. highly polished. Mm-hmm. Took a lot of skill so to you could make these reflect mirrors. Them. So do you know that ancient mirrors were metallic? The mirrors of the Egyptians were made of a mixed metal, chiefly copper. Now, they were usually small, what we would classify as a handheld mirror, and uh, they were made with great skill. The handles, which were of wood, stone, or metal, were artistically shaped and highly ornamented. Now, this is what I find fascinating about this portion of scripture. Um, Because of history and, and archaeology, the Egyptian women were in the habit of carrying a mirror in one hand when they went to their temples to worship. It may be that the Hebrew women imitated this custom when they brought their mirrors to the door of the tabernacle. Melt the sucker down. Of make the congregation. An altar. So you can see, because you, you think to yourself, well, why would they have their mirrors with them at, at the entrance to the tabernacle? And they, it, it's thought that perhaps it was something that they imitated from the Egyptian women. And a lot of times these mirrors were a part of the ornamentation of their garments. And so, so these were given that is very to, cool. to, that to is become the bronze laver. Isn't that, isn't that okay, so cool? Okay, what so I, what I can intimate from that mm-hmm. is that God was saying, I don't want you to worship like the Egyptians worship. Mm-hmm. And I don't want this to be about what you look like. I want this to be about who I am Mm -hmm. and what I've done for you. Mm -hmm. So here we have this image of Jesus Christ must increase and we must decrease. Well, think about it. What's um, what's amazing too is that it wasn't just it wasn't just a you know a, co- a condemnation of the practice. It was he accepted them as they were and then required of them. Okay, that's great. Bring them, but now you're going to make something different right. out of it. Exactly. Just very. It's a great concept. And also the bronze laver was where the the priests would wash, mm-hmm. and and so mirrors are to to be a reflection of w- what you're looking like, and yet we know further on that that Jesus washes away all of our Very sins interesting. This is fascinating stuff. Good job, Janice. Um, you know, I don't know what that means, though, if you carry a compact mirror to church in your purse. I'm not sure what that means or if it means nothing, anything. Nothing, <laughs> okay, nothing, right, nothing. I'm just, I'm just asking glass, a question. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, well, and the, the truth is that 
with the scripture is very clear that we have to emphasize, we emphasize Christ in our lives and, and that's the main thing. And it's, let's be a reflection of Him. Mm -hmm. In fact, and Jesus said, you know, it's the heart. You need to focus on the heart and that's very important. All right. Well, the Bible also says in Matthew chapter 5 and 6, Jesus is talking about this and He says where your money is, that's where your heart is. Now, we simply ask you if you believe in God's Word that it should be broadcast and that it should be a part of our daily lives and learning, then we would encourage you to consider giving to this ministry. We need partners just like you. Now, the address is on the screen. If you would like to support us in any amount, you can write for that wise guide, which is the print companion to this program, taking you through the Bible in one year. And we would pray, ask you to pray about it and ask what God would have you do. God's wisdom at work in our lives from Exodus chapter 39. Everywhere God's call is accepted, His anointing is set. Everywhere God's anointing is set, His holiness is at work. Everywhere God's holiness is at work, His wisdom is laboring to change us. Now the priests of ancient Israel were set at the very center of the camp reminding the Israelites and us that God's chief activity in our lives is not to make us happy but to make us holy. Holiness always brings joy and gladness, which are states of being and not a feeling. So today we pray, Lord, I willingly accept your commands and conditions which you have set in my life to make me holy. Now as we conclude the program today, we come to our Wise Up segment where we are studying Proverbs chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. Here's just a few lines from that proverb. You should read it on your own today when you get a chance. It says, My son, if you become surety for your friend, if you have shaken hands in a pledge for a stranger, you are snared by the words of your mouth. Wow, what an amazing thing. You know, the mouth is a powerful thing. In the spiritual realm, the mouth is, is, is unyielding. And we treat speech loosely in our culture because we have free speech and we often do not really recognize or bear the consequences of speech so we think. But then we look around at the culture and we realize how powerful it is. In fact, the Bible says this, if you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord, while you believe in your heart that He died on the cross and rose again, you shall be saved. You see, what you say matters. And today, if you want to meet Jesus Christ, if you want to know Him, there's an emptiness in your heart, you can say it. You can say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose again for my sin to give me eternal life. I confess you as Lord, and He will change your life if you mean it. Thanks for joining us today on the Quick Study Television program. Remember this, if you would like my commentary on the Wise Up segment today, exclusively on YouTube and Facebook, make sure you go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and subscribe to our YouTube and Facebook accounts.